everybody. Today I have lots of reviews for you. I'm going to be doing my March wrap up. I have individually reviewed all of these books on the channel. They are full of spoilers. So they're like spoilery recaps. There's no non-spoiler section. So if you watch one of those videos, you will get all of the details. <laughs> I warned you. But in this one, I'm just going to give you my general thoughts on what the books are about. So this is your non-spoiler reviews collection of the books that I read for March. So I finished a total of 19 novels and I also tried two other books that I DNF'd. So first we have The Coldest Girl in Cold Town by Holly Black. So in this world, there is lots of cities that are called cold towns. This is where vampires live and also where humans who want to become vampires sometimes go into these places as well as people who have been bitten by a vampire and could possibly turn into one also get sent to these locations. This is how the government allows the vampires and the humans to coexist because if they didn't have some sort of separation like this, then the vampires would just take over the world and there would be no humans. But the vampires also don't want that because then they won't have a blood source. <laughs> so <laughs> it's like a balanced system. This main girl wakes up after the night of a party to find all of her friends and like people she goes to high school with in a pile of dead bodies in, her, in the living room. Um, she does find one person that's still breathing, but who has been bit, which just so happens to be her ex-boyfriend. So she's like, great. So I want to save him. I'm the only one who's not been bitten though. So I am in danger by hauling him around, but I don't want him to have to go to a cold town because once you get in one, you can never get out. But if you've been bitten, and you can last and you can resist long enough to not drink human blood for like a 90 day period, then you will remain human. You will not be changed into a vampire. And so she doesn't want to take basically his life away from him by reporting him as someone who has gone cold, meaning going through the process of potentially becoming a vampire where you do seriously crave <laughs> for everything. And you find out early on that she lost her mother because her mother was bitten. They tried to detox her, but it didn't work. I won't get into the details of how that went down, but you can watch my spoiler thing if you want to know how. And so she knows what that looks like. And she knows that she doesn't have a lot of time to get him somewhere where he can um, be away from people and not endanger anyone else, but also not report him to the, to the cult towns. So... She also kind of gets grazed at one point, and so she doesn't know if she's going to go cold or not. So she also has to get away from her family <laughs> at the same time because she doesn't want to accidentally, like, kill them. And I really enjoyed that part of the book. I enjoyed everything up until the point where they go into a cold town. Once you get to the cold town, there's a whole nother plot that unravels and character backgrounds that you see with some of the vampires that are involved because they do rescue one of the vampires who like warns him that the other vampires that just went around and massacred everyone are still in the house. So they like took pity on, on him and saved him. Um, and there is like vouchers that you can get by turning in a vampire in order to get out of cold town, but that's the only way you're ever going to get out. And so there's this whole other complex network of things that are happening. However, I didn't care about all that. I just wanted this to be a second chance vampire romance with her and her ex. And that is not what I got. So after they got to cold town, I was just really disappointed. So honestly, I didn't really like this book. Um, there was a romance that happened in the story, but I just didn't care for it. I just, honestly, I was just very apathetic <laughs> once they got into Cold Town. I just, it was not the story that I wanted, and so I didn't like it. <laughs> it was, I, I like romance to be at the focus of my stories, or there's not enough emotions going on because action, action 
and intrigue can only take you so far. Romance is what I need in a book to be able to feel something. Because <laughs> I am so desensitized to, like, death and all this other kind of stuff from books. I don't care. But the romance, that's what can make me feel something. So anyway, uh, I gave it four stars. Then we have Morgan, which is supposedly part of the Remnant Chronicles. And I absolutely loved that series. So, of course, I wanted to read this one. Honestly, I don't see the connection. So, if you just want to read Morgan, I feel like you can do that. And I don't think it's going to spoil anything from the other series. I also think it takes place like hundreds of years before. So, it's kind of like a prequel novella. This is very much so what I'm talking about by I Need a Romance at the Center of My Books. This is a, like, high fantasy. It kind of has a prehistoric feel in that everyone is, like, hunters and gatherers. There's no electricity. And certain people have this knowing sense about them where they can locate places that have good soil or, you know, places where animals will be. Which is good because the tribes that don't have these people often have to scavenge or steal from other communities in order to survive or they'll starve to death. So the main guy, the love interest, is from one of those communities that steals. <laughs> but this person happens to have a knowing sense and they wind up falling for each other. And then it's like, well, what happens if we get caught? Because then your tribe is going to like want to steal me away. And... She also is never supposed to talk to any outsiders, so, like, she could get in trouble for talking to an outsider. So, like, they're putting themselves in a vulnerable situation. So, this is a very high stakes with the romance. And if there's anything I love about romance, it's the forbidden kind. So, I loved it. I gave it five stars. Then I read Onyx, which is part of the Lux series, which I gave five stars, as well as Opal, which I gave five stars. Origin, which I gave 4.5 stars. Opposition, also 4.5 stars. And Shadows, 5 stars. Okay, so this is an Alien series. Again, romance is at the center of this one, but there's definitely some plot things that are happening in each book. There's people discovering and enhancing their powers. Um, there is the DOD that gets involved at one point, and there's like an opposing alien race. <laughs> And so the different alien races have conflicting views on how they want to coexist with humans. Some of them want to overtake the humans, and some of them just want to coexist with them. And so, yeah, there's some kidnapping that goes on in this series. There's lots of stuff. I will say that if you like Twilight, this is not Twilight, but if you like Twilight, I feel like there's enough parallels where you'll be super into it. But I liked this romance more than I did, like, Bella and Edward. This has, like, the true enemies to lovers thing going on. It has a consistent, consistent couples throughout the series, which I find very rare when it comes to series. So if you'd like to know that the first guy that you fall for when reading is going to be the in-game guy, read this series because that's what you're going to get. Um, but, yeah, the romance, it is... It is a YA book. However, there are some sexy times. <laughs> um, I feel like when it comes to sex in YA, um, there is a line. And I feel like this one got to the edge of it. Where it's, it's, it wasn't erotic. It wasn't like written to titillate. The, the word choices used to describe the sexual encounters, I feel like were on point. It was more so about the emotions and less so about what physical parts are doing. If you know what I'm saying. So, but yeah, if you like, if you like the, like, upper YA type books with the romance and stuff and want something with some sci-fi elements, then I would recommend the Lux series by Jennifer L. Armentrout. Then we go into an arc that I read, which was different for boys. This is my first story that I read from this author. And I will say that it made me curious enough about his writing to read more. However, I only gave this story a 3.5 star. It is pitched as a graphic novel, 
which is a lie. It is not a graphic novel, okay? It is formatted more so like a picture book where you have words on one page and like one illustration on the other page. I did not like the art style at all. It was very rough pencil sketch art. Um, I didn't find any of the characters appealing. Like, I don't need to be attracted to the characters. That sounds like a very weird thing to say. But I need to like the... The art style needs to, to be appealing. It needs to be aesthetic. And this was just not my my art at all. Did not like the art. Uh the writing was okay, but there definitely was not a real plot. This was more so a message book where it's trying to convey a message by using a fiction, but it's not, there's not like a big character arc thing that's happening. There's not, there's, there's not really a plot. All right. Uh, so the point of this book was basically this guy, he's gay and he's like, okay, I've done X, Y, and Z with this other dude. So does that mean that I'm no longer a virgin or not? Because how virginity has been defined, there has to be penetration of the male part with the female part. <laughs> so if you got two dinglings, um, <laughs> they don't penetrate each other. Now, of course, there's other ways that that can happen, but um, there's even people that will debate that because, again, the definitions are typically the heteronormative definitions of uh, the form of the sex would lead to procreation. Um, otherwise, it's not technically sex. Um, Whereas some people are like, you know what? If it's oral, it's sex. Um, so this is this character kind of coming to his own understanding of himself. It doesn't even matter if he's a virgin or not. And kind of the overall point is that virginity is a social construct. It's not really a medical thing that can be determined. Um, and so that's the point the author was trying to make with the story, which I think he did well with that. He also redacted everything when they were talking about the sex stuff. Um, but there would still be homophobic slurs throughout the book, which is like a commentary on society as well because they're like oh this is inappropriate this is inappropriate this is inappropriate and yet they'll have someone calling someone the f word and it's like where are you developing your lines of sensitivity <laughs> because like this is not okay um and, and just a commentary on censorship as a whole when it comes to like lgbt books being censored um when it's for like kids because like oh that's not appropriate so they took out all the lgbt stuff and they took out um foul language <laughs> other than the slurs and so it very much so is like a message book where the author is trying to make a point with it um but it feels like that it does not feel like i read a contemporary fiction graphic novel so yeah i give it 3.5 then we have Mickey Seven. So this is a sci-fi or sci-fi fantasy rather because they are on another planet and they also have like a spaceship that they traveled on for nine years. Mickey is an expendable. So Mickey has to upload his consciousness before he goes on dangerous missions and then if he dies they will make a clone of him to continue to carry out the dangerous missions because they can only have so many people on the ship. There's just not enough room, but they still need someone to be able to do dangerous things like working with a reactor <laughs> or antimatter. Um, and so Mickey is the dude that does that. However, the guy who created this system to be able to download the consciousness and then like create a clone. He used it to take over a colonized planet by making hundreds of clones of himself so that he could rule his own little world. And so they have a rule against having doubles. So you cannot have two expendables whose original consciousness, consciousness was the same person. In the first chapter, Mickey falls down a hole and no one wants to come rescue him because it's too dangerous and they only have one life. So they're like, all right, dude, we'll just make another one of you when we get back to the station. You just stay down there and die. So they like freeze to death. He was gonna, he's gonna freeze to death. However, hey, there is the, these creatures that are under there and he's able to follow one of these creatures out and then get back to his like ship but they have already created Mickey number eight, which means he is now a double. And like I said, it's not allowed. So if they find out, they're probably going to kill one of them off. And so the new Mickey is like, I, I haven't had any life to live yet. You've got to let me live. You can't have me killed. And then, of course, Mickey seven is like, well, it's not my fault that you they made you when they shouldn't have. 
And so they're having to split their rations. And then they have this captain who is, there's like a group of people who are against the whole cloning thing. Um, they see the clones as like shells of humans. They're not real beings. And so they just wish that they didn't exist at all. And his captain is one of these people. And so anytime he can find some way to punish Mickey for merely existing, he does so. And so he winds up cutting Mickey's rations <laughs> further down because of a bet that his friend made <laughs> where he did some dangerous stuff. There is some romance in this. I really liked the romance. It's shallow. Don't get me wrong. It's a very shallow romance. But I liked it anyway. It was entertaining. <laughs> it was entertaining. The whole book was entertaining. I cannot wait for the next book, which is already out. I hope that my library gets the audio for it because I really enjoyed the audio book. Um, but it's called Antimatter or Antimatter, however you want to pronounce that. But yeah, I gave the sucker five stars um, and I only gave you the basic setup. So definitely check it out. You can also watch my spoiler video if you want to be spoiled. It's there. Spoils, individual spoilies for all of these books. All right. Then we have Passing Strange, which I gave five stars. This is the third book in a zombie series that I've been reading called Generation Dead. And there's one book left in the series. I don't own it. <laughs> and I'm on a book buying ban for the year. So, like, I can receive books as gifts, but I can't buy any. <laughs> so, <laughs> I can't buy any. So, it might be next year before I get to read book four because my library does not have the fourth book. And so I'll have to buy it at some point. <sighs> but anyway, so this one follows some of the zombies, which it did not really do in the previous books. You mostly just followed Phoebe. But in this one, you're getting like multiple zombie perspectives, which I really appreciated. Also, I was definitely getting vibes. <laughs> I was getting the vibes. Um that the main character in this one was lesbian and so then you start reading the chapter and she's talking about like her love but she doesn't say any genders or anything like that no names nothing and i'm like are we gonna find out are we gonna find out and yes she is i was right i was here for it um so yeah i liked getting to see that in there it was unexpected but expected Oh, it, was, it was a pleasant um, addition to the series, but it was not like a just like randomly dropped in thing that authors sometimes do where it's like, you didn't code them at all. This feels like a brownie point thing that you're trying to reward yourself by making it more inclusive. No, this, I could tell from the first book that that was probably the case. So I liked it because I was like, ha. Ah confirmation <laughs> but anyway um so in this book you find that out and um you also find out the reasons why this person had died by suicide um and then now that they've come back as a zombie they want to live more than ever so it's like when they were living they didn't want to be living and now that they're not living they want to be living and the zombies have like lost all of their rights at this point by the third book and this character is seen as more functional than other zombies their speech patterns are faster just everything about them is more human they have senses that other zombies don't have so there's like some things going on here where you're just like what is this conclusion going to be <clears throat> and anyway <laughs> Anyway, um, so she works at a mall and she's like passing herself as human, which can be very dangerous, especially because she's going undercover at this point with this like secret identity as this human girl to date the guy who's been killing zombies since book one <laughs> so that she can prove that some actions that the zombies were blamed for and therefore no longer have their rights because of were not actually taken by the zombies. And so, yeah, I'm really interested to see what happens in before. I will say 
that the kind of twisty twist and like the reason why some hum some of the zombies are like more functional than other zombies is very much so the same kind of allegory thing that <clears throat> was done in warm bodies it was like an allegory for like lgbt um rights and stuff and like the whole love is love thing like a approving of that how I, I don't want to spoil warm bodies either but if you've if you've read that that's kind of the theory that these zombies have on why some of them are more functional than others and can they be brought back to life you'll have to read to find out but, um, I really like the series I feel like this series um, you could slot in any area any area um, that faces some form of uh, oppression or faces some form of uh, just like people having like negative thoughts or views toward them and it fits within the context of the book so like there could definitely be a case made for like this book talks about the treatment of the disabled community and the LGBT community and people of color like anything you can plop it in and you will find ways to be like this is what this author is trying to say this is what this author is trying to say so it's kind of fun um but nothing is like so specific that it feels like it's just beating you over the head with trying to get this underlying message it doesn't feel like a message book it feels like a paranormal book <laughs> so i like that i like that because i don't like I don't like beat you over the head books. Those don't work for me. But anyway, next we have, uh, I gave that one five stars, if you couldn't tell. And then next we have Catherine House, which I gave five stars as well. This was interesting because I was like, hmm, like how we talked earlier about a book that doesn't have a plot and me being like, well, it didn't really have a plot. So it like it did what it wanted to do, but it just didn't really go there for me because it didn't have a plot. <laughs> Catherine House didn't have a plot, but it got five stars. Why? Because sometimes an author can do one thing so exceptionally well that it makes the whole book. It's like the authors where you're like, I could read this person's grocery list and I would give it five stars. That is what this book is. <laughs> okay because of the atmosphere so if you are wanting something that's very atmospheric you just like just kind of it's relaxing it was so relaxing to listen to and so i liked all of the characters it's like a very diverse group of people and um they're at this like kind of boarding school but they're completely isolated from the outside world they have no communication with the outside world for like the three years that they sign on to be at this place and there's like these plasma pins and there's some like weird seancey almost stuff happening <laughs> once you get to the higher grades where you're like repeating phrases i am in the house the house is in me da 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 like some weird creepy stuff is happening I just gotta say, <laughs> I am not okay <laughs> with Bay Bay <laughs> because Baby was like my favorite character. Okay, um, this is I'm not like spoiling anything here because I'm not I'm not telling you anything about what happened. Don't make any assumptions because your assumptions will be wrong, but. <sighs> I'm just like, why? Why did baby? Why? Why, baby? <laughs> why? <laughs> also, the ending. The ending of the book. And the headlights came towards. I'm like, what ending is that? <laughs> what? What ending is that? Oh my goodness. Oh, but the atmosphere. The atmosphere. It's all about the atmosphere. <laughs> But the ending was like really vague because I said like in the headlights came, but it wasn't like oh, I'm standing on the road and then I'm in the headlights and I'm about to get ran over. It was not that. It was just like literally, and I saw the headlights of the car and I'm like, what? What car? Who was in it? Where's the two? <laughs> nothing. 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 I don't like endings like that. I do not like open endings. 
unless it is open to the point where it's like you can definitely have like a version of events that is very probable. This is like, no, you're not, you're not leading me in any direction to figure out what you want. The end of the, I don't know. Anyway, then we have <laughs> three weeks to say goodbye, which I gave five stars. <sighs> so this guy and his wife adopted this kid and they've had her for nine months. The mom signed over her rights. She got knocked up in high school and she was like, I am not with the guy. I don't even like the guy. I don't want this baby. And so you can have her. <laughs> so she signs off her rights. And then nine months later, judge comes knocking on the door. It's like, yeah, so we're going to, we're going to take the baby. Cause we want, we want the baby because see the da baby daddy didn't tell his parents that he got a girl knocked up. And now all of a sudden they want the baby because they, they figured it out. And, um, there was a reason why they want the baby and the judge is not an upstanding citizen. <laughs> okay. Okay. Huh? So yeah, this one was funny. They had like a gangster coming into the house and flushing a remote control down the toilet to try to stir up some stuff. Some weird stuff happening in this book, but it got me. It got me in chapter one. I didn't care about any of the additional plotline stuff that was going on, the little bit of the outside mystery as to why do they really want this baby. I didn't care about any of that. I was there for the characters because I was like, if I had adopted a kid, then all of a sudden the grandparents start showing up and the baby daddy don't even want nothing to do with the kid. I'm like, just sign your rights over. The baby's happy. We're happy. Leave us alone. <laughs> so, anyway, moving on. <laughs> then we have persuasion which I gave 3.5 stars. I'm kind of coming to the understanding that when it comes to the romances with Jane Austen, the movies are better than the books. The movies follow the book. <laughs> Don't get me wrong. They follow the books. It's the same story, the same lines, but <laughs> the movies are better than the books because the actors and actresses or whatever you want to call them, they portray these characters and you can just visualize everything and you can use their body language to interpret things that you don't get to really interpret while reading the book. So yeah, I'm going to say it. I prefer the movies. <laughs> I prefer the movies. But, um, I just don't get why these women are head over heels for these men. And I don't get any context for the reasons why they like each other in the books. This is not the epitome of romance. This is not it. <laughs> this is not it. Um, but I like them. I like them. But it is not the epitome of romance. I need some more. I need some more than the bare service minimum of, oh, he ain't hating on me. So therefore, I'm going to marry him. I'm like, no. Just because the guy's nice to you don't mean you can't get married to him. And so, um, <laughs> So this one, this one, Anne and the dude, can't remember his name, Wentworth, Wentworth, yeah, Anne and Wentworth, they had been talking, and he had proposed to her like eight years ago, but he didn't have any money, and he didn't have a title, so her, like, family friend or whatever told her, don't marry him, because he's not going to be able to take care of you, because women don't have no rights and they ain't gotten their own wealth, so they have to depend on men. And uh, so she's like, okay, I won't marry him. So she doesn't. Well, then eight years later, he comes back into town, and she's still in love with him. <laughs> but now <laughs> her sister's sister-in-law got a thing for him, too. So she's like, well, I guess it's now or never. <laughs> but both of them have so much pride, they won't admit that they even had a relationship back then. <laughs> They're just trying to pretend around everyone like it never happened. Yet they, they want to be together now because now, now he comes back and he's like the admiral in the Navy. And so he's got a title, a commoner's title, but a title. And he's got some moolah. <laughs> and I'm just like, if I were you, Wentworth, I would have been like, you missed your chance. <laughs> you missed, I wasn't good enough for you when I was Poe. I ain't good enough for you now, or you ain't, you ain't good enough for me now, rather, yeah, yeah, you can't have me when I'm po, then I'm too good for you now, <laughs> bye, bye so anyway, I liked it, but at the same time, I'm just like, hmm. <laughs> okay, okay, what am I going on here, 
Next is something like gravity, which I gave five stars, five stars, okay? Um, so this one I read, I've had this on my shelf for a couple of years, but there was the Trans Rights Readathon. So I was like, what better time to read this book? So I read it and it was so good. But also, Amber, <laughs> Amber, can you give us some solid, solid, definite 100% happy ever afters, okay? Because the endings are like where you're like, hmm, I love this relationship. It is a romance, but I can't tell if this is a, if I can't tell if this is a happy ever after or not with the ending. Um, luckily for the other book that I've read by her, there is a sequel. Ah! So we're going to get the defined happy ever after 100%. Mm. Yep. We're going to know for sure. That's what I want to know that they're going to be together forever. That's what I want to know. I don't want happy for now. I want, Hey baby boo, come over here. <laughs> That's what I want. <laughs> so I'm glad we're getting a sequel. Will we get a sequel for this book? I want one. <laughs> Was everything resolved in this book? Yes. Do I want a sequel? Yes, I do. I want a sequel. <sighs> so both of these characters are keeping secrets. One of them has come to live with his aunt during the summer because in school he was bullied and like trigger warning there was an attempted um, assault there was assault to a degree definitely for sure um, but like full 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 it, it could have got gone further is what I'm saying so it happened it was in there it was graphic disturbing um, it could have been even worse and so this person is like, you know what? I need to just go for the summer. I need to just get away and be myself. And so he has one parent that's fully on board. That's like, yeah, you know, we'll talk about all the transition process. Um, get you on the hormones, do everything you need to do. I gotcha. The mom will like casually dead name the son um, or misgender, uh, the dad is on board, but also tends to misgender. And so the guy's like, I know y'all love me, but I just need some time with someone that fully accepts me, which is the aunt. So he goes to live with her. Lo and behold, next door neighbor girl <laughs> got the hots for him. <laughs> yes, she does. And, um, that girl, her sister died like two years previously, um, suddenly from like a heart, a heart defect. Uh, so like she was just playing a sport in the gym and <laughs> passed out, um, gone. And so she never really kind of knew who she was as herself. So now that her sister's gone, she's kind of like taking on the persona of her sister. And, um, to the point where when she meets this guy, she was like pretending to be super into photography and all this other kind of stuff. And so when they would have conversations about like goals and stuff, she basically would just steal whatever her sister's goal was. Um, so she's been lying to him about that. And then he hasn't come out to her. So she doesn't know which the thing is. Some of y'all might be like, Oh, that's so wrong. He should have told her that he was like trans day one. But there's a safety concern with that because it can be very dangerous to be trans and you don't know who you can trust. So different people determine what their boundary is for that. Um, like, okay, do you just make sure you tell them before you kiss because then you've, you've gone to like that next step or do you just tell them once you've gotten to a point where you can trust them or is it you don't tell them until like you're stripping off your clothes and then you're like, ha, surprise. Um, <laughs> so everyone's got their different lines. So even though technically, technically he was withholding the truth about his full identity, um, like you can't, you can't be mad at him for that. Um, so she accidentally discovers that he's trans because she sees him undressing. And uh, so then, of course, she violated a boundary. But she does not to tell him that she saw because she doesn't want him to act strange around her um, or feel like he needs to reveal his truth before he's ready. So I understand the reason why she didn't tell him that she saw. 
But at the same time, that means that she was lying to him. So again, the whole time, there's just like these secrets between them that can destroy them when they come out. Um, so yeah, it is a like a coming of age story um, about like identity, um, not just like the sexual or gender identity, but just like actual like identity, like who am I type identity. Um, who am I really? The philosophical point, the philosophical. Um, so, <laughs> all right, so yeah, that's that. Um, but yeah, I loved, loved, loved their romance. I loved it, I loved it. And I think that her initial response to finding out made a lot of sense. Um, I think any other initial response would have been unrealistic. So I liked it. But anyway, then we have the glass arrow and my nerve in my thigh is starting to burn. Starting to burn. <sighs> okay. I pop, this is why I sit down when I make these videos, okay? Because when I stand up, I be moving around, I get hyper. I <laughs> Okay, the glass arrow <laughs> I gave 4.5 stars. So this one, they live in a world where it is difficult for women to give birth to sons or even to give birth in general. However, the people that live outside of the city, for some reason, their bodies are able to pop out boys easier. So when the census get low and they need more uh, boys, then they basically steal away the women from these outside places and um, sell them off, auction them off to the highest bidder. And um, they're just there to be baby makers. Um, and there's also a big thing with the purchasers wanting people who are intact. And there is like um, virginity inspections which is interesting because the thing is, is that they did have those type things um, with like royalty. And so there would be suspicion cast on a woman if during the first sexual encounter, which by the way was watched, they would watch the whole consummation thing. They would watch to see that it like actually happened. I would not want to be doing it for the first time with people watching me. I wouldn't want to be doing it for the thousandth time with people watching me. No, thank you. No, thank you. But so that was the thing. And like, if the women didn't bleed, then these men who don't know nothing about vaginas would assume that they were going around with other people. Here is a little anatomy lesson for you. Well, no, I didn't even know <laughs> because I was a virgin until I got married. So I also thought that I was like supposed to bleed and it was supposed to be painful the first time. And it was not. It was not. Because if you have a partner that cares about you, <laughs> they'll make sure that they're not just showing it. <laughs> okay. So most women, most women, the hymen is flexible. It's not just scrunchy. So if you give it time to adjust, it'll make room for, for the, for the peen. Okay. It'll make room. It'll make room. And then when it's done, it'll just, you know, scrunch back down. It's all good. No rips, no tears, no bleed, no pain. Okay. But some women's is more, uh, less, less, less elastic or whatever, less flexible. Okay. So some women do bleed. Some women do have a harder experience with the first time. Some of that is due to anatomy. Some of that is due to the guy being a jack. You gotta watch. <laughs> okay. Word of advice. Do not lie to your partner and be like, yeah, I'm experienced. <laughs> you can just shove it on in. I don't need new. I don't need nothing. <laughs> no, if you haven't done it, you need to tell him. Okay. Cause you're going to need a second to adjust. <laughs> it's a squinchy. <laughs> The scrunchy will stretch, okay. But if they try going there, <laughs> yeah, it might hurt. It might hurt. So yeah, just communicate. It's okay to have a conversation during the act and be like, hey, it's the first time, or hey, every time is like the first time. So I'm gonna have to tell you, stop. <laughs> Go. Stop. Red light, green light. That's what you need to be doing in the bedroom. Red light, green light. Okay. Remember that. <laughs> anyway, so yeah, the whole thing with like disappearing, it happened in history. It shows up in fantasy books time and time again. But is it a real thing? Yes and no. Can it actually test for virginity? No, <laughs> no. Can it test for sexual trauma? Yes. And so that's going to be, again, if it's a traumatic situation, it's probably going to be the case where the partner does not care. So they're just going at it and that's when you're going to get rips and tears. So that's why there are examinations post-sexual violence that can be done to prove that there was something non-consensual happening because the, the perpetrator did not care. Um, so those tests are valid, but virginity tests are not. So that is your PSA today for today. Okay. <clears throat> Uh, then we have number 16, Metal Town, which I gave three stars. This is a, yeah, this makes me think of Tale of Two Cities, even though I've never read it. Like, please, some more. And like working like child labor in the industrial system and um, being put in very 
dangerous situation. "Oh, you have little hands! Crawl inside the machine and take this off the chopper so it will run. You might lose a finger, but it's okay, because business will resume." That's what Metal Town was like. So these kids are like, you know what? The adults that are over 18, they have some protections. They have like this union that they formed where they're going to get paid. Uh, they're not going to lose their job if they get sick for a day. Like they, they get a break during the day. Whereas these kids, they've been working sometimes for a whole week with no pay. They get injured, they get fired. They get sick, they get fired. There's like, there's no room for nothing and no breaks. And they're put into dangerous situations where they're like hacking on fumes and all this other kind of stuff, losing fingers. And so they're like, you know what? We're tired of this. <laughs> so we need to have like a union. So they decide to go on strike. And then you get the perspective of the girl who is the daughter of the owner of these facilities. And so she comes down into one and she is like so shocked because she didn't know that none of this stuff was happening. She thought that they were all being treated fairly. <laughs> naive, naive little girl. And um, so, of course, she's like, this ain't right. So she feels like if she just talks to her dad and lets him know what's going on, that he'll solve the problems. But he knows that it's going on. <laughs> And he doesn't care as long as he gets the money and they're doing these things to fund a war because the war is profitable for them. So yeah, this one is very interesting. It's very like got that kind of like a little bit of the political intrigue, I guess you would say to it. Um, even though they're not like into politics, it's just like the whole thought processes of the privilege basically <laughs> make money off. Of it. So anyway, yeah, that's Metal Town three stars. Then I read Slumber, Volume 1, The Art. The Art. Excellent. Excellent, excellent, excellent. Love the color usage. I love pastel horror. I just gotta say. <laughs> make it gory, but make it pink, purple, and blue. That's what I want to see. Yes, please. And so this one was fantastic. Loved the art style. Liked the writing. Liked what was happening. So this one, there's these people that are being killed and there's a detective that's on the case and they keep getting the same kind of like calling card type thing that you see in mysteries where there'll be like a certain symbol that's carved into someone or they might actually leave a literal calling card <laughs> um, to like signify that they're the one that carried out this death. Well, this is happening all over the place. And, but the thing is, is that the people that wake up with these bodies that have like killed them, that have blood on their hands, like wake up with the knife, that sort of thing. They're like, I don't remember doing this. I don't think I did this. It, this was like a dream. And then I woke up and it was real. And like someone, it was like someone was in control of my body. I was possessed. It wasn't me. So of course they aren't believed until the detective <laughs> winds up happening in his dream. He wakes up and finds that he chopped up a body and left it in the refrigerator. So then he's like, well, oh, hell, I need to figure out what's happening. Well, the calling card that's left behind is basically saying, like, take me to the dream, the dream eater or something like that. So he uses this calling card that has this dream person on it. And so what she does with her agency is they go through this red door that allows you to go into the dreams of another person. And her and this, like, goblin figure who also likes to eat human flesh inside of the dreams, um, they, they kill your nightmares so that you don't have those figures in your nightmare, near, nightmares anymore because you kill them and then they're gone. So he goes there and the woman finds that this is the, the nightmare thing, the being that she's been wanting to find for over a decade because it was one that was created in her daughter's mind and her daughter died. So it's like the only piece of her daughter that's left and she wants to take it out. And so that is the premise of this story. I'm not going to tell you anymore. you got to read it. Um, but there is the spoilers. So you can watch the spoiler one. Uh, but I gave that five stars. Then we have Pacifica, which I gave three stars. Honestly, I don't even know what to tell you about this book. I feel like my headspace was just like... When I was reading it and I just didn't care. I wanted to DNF it um, pretty much from the halfway point on, um, but not even really liking it in the beginning. It was, 
I think it was a matter of headspace and just bad timing of reading it and not necessarily any fault of the author or the book itself. I think it was mostly a me thing, but also not having, it had of the three books, um, well, I read four books from this author this month, but of the three, meaning the two that I already talked about, Metal Town and um, The Glass Arrow, and then this one, it actually had one of the most centered kind of romance plot lines, and um, I just wasn't feeling it. I wasn't feeling it. And I think that this one also had so much imagery that I got lost in it in a bad way. Um, so I feel like it would work better for like a film medium rather than a book. Um, but I think I will hold on to it to maybe read it in a couple of years, read it physically, not by audiobook, and process it better. I just feel like there was so much to process in a standalone book like that. So it is a dystopian book. <clears throat> the main character, I think, um, some way or another, um, was from like Japan at some point. Oh, my leg is completely numb and burning now with my thigh. I have nerve, nerve damage, but, uh, so I can't do prolonged standing, which I've done for this video. Oh my gosh, I've been standing for 15 minutes. Are you kidding me? Okay. <sighs> All right. Oh, my leg. So anyway, this one is like global warming and there's like the melting ice caps and cities that are now underwater and resources are running out and the people that are in charge don't want to share the resources. So they have come up with this idea of this like awesome island that's supposed to be better for people. And so they run a lottery and you can win the lottery and be taken to this island. But what you don't know is that the island is like unsurvivable and you're probably going to die there, especially because there are already people that are on the island um, that are have basically turned into pirates. And um, so they don't want you on their island. So you're probably going to die out to sea is what's going to happen. And so the guy in here is the president's son and he went with the vice president's son to like this rally that was happening he wanted to see what was going on he was just curious he wanted to live a day in other people's shoes and not be the the uh, privileged spoiled president's child for a day and so he went there and um his bodyguard winds up shooting the girl that was with him because she thought that he was kidnapping her uh, she, he thought that she was kidnapping him and then his, I guess something, a fight breaks out or something. I can't remember, but his, uh, the, he gets separated from the vice president's son. And so then, uh, he gets taken away by the bodyguard. And when he comes back, he realizes that, um, his friend Adam or whatever is not there. And the girl that got shot did not die. She just got grazed, but she knows where Adam is. So he's like, take me to Adam. <laughs> and she's like, I'll tell you who took him and like where I think they're going with him, but you've got to give me money. <laughs> so he's like, well, I don't have any money on hand, but I can promise you double if you'll take me. So she's like, okay. So the whole book is just them adventuring and then finding out what's going on with the government behind the scenes. Um, that is the book. Um, so anyway, yeah. Then we have the last book that I read that I finished today, which is why this video is going out so late, because I finished it. I pretty much read the whole thing today. Um, whoo, that is Article 5 by Kirsten, Kristen Simmons. So I, not going to lie, after reading Pacifica and it kind of being met, and then the Metal Town not being hyped the way I wanted it to, and even The Glass Arrow, even at a 4.5, just not being what I really wanted, um, in terms of the emotional connection that I seek with books, I was going to DNF and unhaul. I was going to unhaul this whole trilogy and I, I own another book from, from it too. I don't own, I don't own one of the books, but luckily my library has the audio, so I'm not worried about it, but I own the third book. So anyway, I was going to DNF and just get rid of it, lighten my load and not read anything else from the author. Cause I just didn't get a five star out of the bunch. However, I had already downloaded the audiobook 
for this book. And I was like, I don't want to waste my credit. So I might as well listen to like 30 minutes just to see. Dude, <laughs> this thing is like a YA. This is the YA Handmaid's Tale. Okay, <laughs> that's exactly what this is. I don't know which one came out first. I would I would say Handmaid's Tale probably came out first. I feel like it came out in like the 80s. I don't know. This one came out in... Well, let's find out. Hey, Alexa, when was The Handmaid's Tale by Margaret Atwood published? The Handmaid's Tale by Margaret Atwood was published in 1985. That's what I thought, 80s, 1985. This one was published in 2012. If you have watched The Handmaid's Tale show, or you have read the book, you're gonna see a lot of connections with this. But this is like the YA version, and I really enjoy it. Article 5 is, so they have like these moral codes that everyone has to go by. And so one of them is that you cannot have a child out of wedlock. Like, that's a big no-no. And the main character girl is the daughter of a woman who had her out of wedlock so they take her mom to like go to trial but they also take her and take her to like a reform school and she's like I need to find my mother I need to get out and also her boyfriend or I guess ex-boyfriend that um wound up going into the military um so he's part of these enforcement groups that go around but kind of didn't have any other choice but to enlist because his family died, so he was, like, the sole survivor, and, um, that was the only way he could survive, um, so he actually winds up being part of the party that has to arrest her mom, so she's, like, oh, no, so now she's in the school, and she's just, like, I need to get out of here, I need to find my mom, I don't know what they're gonna do to her, um, because they've been really crappy at the school, too, like, the women do not have rights, and, like, the woman from The Handmaid's Tale, that's over all the other women, and she's, like, the worst of them all. She's even worse than the soldiers, but prides herself on, like, being the mother hen. Yeah, there's a character like that in this book. So, obviously, I was, I was like, I don't care if it's a ripoff. I don't care. I enjoyed it. I enjoyed it. And I would have been fine with this being a standalone. Like, it was really good. But there is more that's going to happen because there's another person that we were introduced to in book one that they want to break out because her soldier boyfriend um, wants her. So she is going to like join the revolution. Um, that is the ending is her joining the revolution, but that is not, that's not the point of the book. <laughs> so that doesn't ruin anything. Um, it just kind of leads you into the next books. So yeah, I am really excited um, to see what happens with the people who are fighting against the, the system, because you don't get to see that, really, in the first book. Um, so I want to see what they do in the second book, because the first book is just about, um, the treatment inside of these, like, rehabilitation centers that these kids are at, and, like, the captivity and all of that, and then trying to escape it. Um, and there's also a romance in this story, and I was here for it. I was here for this romance. It did me right. And um, so, yeah, I'm excited to see that continue in the rest of the books. So those are the 19 books that I read, but I also DNF'd two. So it looks like my video clip of the last two books, the ones that I DNF'd, um, <laughs> I didn't film it. <laughs> Um, so I'm just going to do a voiceover for that. One of them was Hauntology or Haunt, Hauntology. Um, I DNF'd this one halfway through. The art style was okay. However, the text itself was so small that even blown up on my computer, it was just really horrible to try to read. And, um, I was having to read it with Adobe Digital Editions because it was an ARC. And so that was the only format available. And scrolling down with the panes, it was so sensitive that it was just painstaking to read simply because of the format and the software that was displaying that particular format. It wasn't as bad 
using the Adobe with the other graphic novel that I gave a five star. Um, but with this particular one, it was just not working out for me. But anyway, this one is basically flash fiction that is horror. So some of them I think hit really well and other ones just needed a lot more room to develop. I think the longest one that I read was like three pages long for one of the stories. So halfway through it, I was like, you know what, this isn't going to be a five star for me. And it's just too much of a pain to try to read um, on the device that I was using. So I just went ahead and DNF'd it. But if you like flash fiction and you like horror and you like black and white graphic novels, then I would say go ahead and give it a try. Next up, we have the last DNF that I did for the month, which was God and the Transgender Debate. So I was interested in this one to see what sort of take they would have on it. Um, there are Christians that are more um, liberal in nature, um, and there are Christians who are very conservative or fundamentalist. So I wasn't sure which viewpoint I was going to get with this one. I was a little hesitant to pick it up because I was pretty sure that it was going to be more so on the fundamentalist side. And uh, I was right to have that hesitation <laughs> because it definitely was. Um, this is a book that I feel like would do way more harm than good. It had a few valid points uh, and some of the historical references were interesting to listen to, but it kept reinforcing gender roles and using the Bible as a way to say like, hey, women are supposed to be like nurturing and all this other kind of stuff. And then talking about um, like sex is meant for procreation, like that's God's design and all this other kind of stuff. And it's like, okay, but even if this book was not about transgender at all, I still would have been offended by it as a woman. <laughs> I'm like, no, I am not here to just make babies and I um I do not agree with the whole women being submissive and all this other kind of stuff it's just very irritating to me and um I'm like yeah this man of course he has this stance growing up in the fundamental church um as a man you have a lot of privileges over women you are seen as the head of the household and so you take this approach of basically wanting like the 1950s housewife. But at the same time, it's so interesting because these same men are like, well, yes, like we don't get paid enough as men now to be like the sole providers of the household. So the women need to work. Yay, women go be in the workforce. And yet women still have all of the same responsibilities. They just have the additional task of also having to work full time now, which is just despicable. I'm like, okay, if you want to say this was God's perfect design for the men to be providers and the head of household, then they need to be the provider and the head of the household. And the woman should be able to stay at home and take care of the kids and cook and clean if that's what you think needs to happen. But see, the men... <laughs> don't take that responsibility they only want the parts that work for them so they want the women to do all of the work <laughs> and help pay the bills and it's like okay you can't say we gotta go buy the book because it says this one thing but then you don't do it but you expect your wife to do it I'm like mm -mm. so just as a woman in general this book was just making me want to pull my hair out um <laughs> And then when it got into the transgender stuff, I was like, okay, well, let's see what this is going to say. I bet it's going to be <laughs> offensive. And uh, I was hoping that it could come to some sort of compassionate middle ground um, that would help people that are on the very, very, very far end of like the picket fence type holding people um, to get them to come closer to maybe a like more um, centrist view 
I guess you would say. I was hoping that maybe it would do that and like use some science to back up um, the points. Uh, but no, it, it did not do that at all. Um, every single point that was made was based off of biblical principles that were being interpreted and written by men. <laughs> Oh my goodness. And I'm like, there is so much research available to you. Why is that your only thing? The Why is that your only thing? And I'm just like, oh my goodness. So this guy is basically saying, okay, let's not um, outcast people who are transgender from the church. Let's welcome them with open arms. But at the same time saying like, this is a... Um, mental illness that needs to be solved and like we need to convert these people because their 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 brain is causing them to like want to live in sin and go against God's design and all this other kind of stuff and I'm just like uh no <laughs> the clip that I had that I had recorded I literally threw the book in the trash can for dramatic effect and so, yeah, <laughs> uh, I think that there are some books that take the conservative approach and they use biblical things to back up their stances um, in a way that can help people that, um, in a way that can help people to understand better um, or people having their own choices because they feel like making particular choices for them as an individual helped their relationship with God. And I can see how those same exact books can be harmful to some but beneficial to others because of the rigid way that belief systems form in your head. Um, but it, they can also cause religious trauma. And so I think a book like this is way too far from the from from the understanding thing that it, it wouldn't even work for that it would not work for that um i feel like it would make someone who was transgender read it f if they were christian and had you know fundamental beliefs and all of that it would make them feel like they were a broken individual and I don't think that that is okay. <laughs> so I do not recommend this book at all. Um, I would be very interested if y'all are still listening and you've read some books that are um, like gender and sexuality affirming that also use the Bible to back up those stances. Um I would love to read those. I think that that could be interesting. I am in the process of deconstructing a lot of the fundamentalist views that I had, um, even up until a couple of years ago. So I understand that I have a long way to go. Um, but having actual scripture, because that is the thing that the fundamentalist side uses for all of their debates, <laughs> um, having scripture um, to back up the affirming side of things, I think would be really useful to have those conversations that could be productive. But I don't know where that material is because even the things that seem like this book with the title could make you to believe that it was going to be one of those affirming books. So it's very hard to decipher um, which books are going to be affirming and which ones are going to um, lure you in under the guise of that and then turn out to be the opposite. Because this one, the beginning ways that it was structured, it did seem like it was going to be an affirming message and it was not. So let me know that down below in the comments because I would love to be able to read um, and recommend those books and even, you know, just further my own um, deconstruction. I'm still definitely 100% Christian. 
<laughs> I'm just deconstructing some of the harmful views that I don't actually think are backed up. And honestly, I think some stuff has been mistranslated and manipulated in order to suit the needs of whoever is printing <laughs> the Bibles at the time. So yeah, y'all let me know. Uh, call me blasphemous, whatever. Um, <laughs> I'll see y'all later. Bye.